Ladies and gentlemen, namaskar, and welcome to the 16th edition of the Jaipur Literature Festival, protected by Detol, Banega, Swast India, at the Bank of Baroda, at, at um, Darbar Hall. We are delighted to introduce The Right to Sex with Amiya Srinivasan in conversation with B. Rowlatt. Academic and writer Amiya Srinivasan's revolutionary debut, debut text, The Right to Sex, Feminism in the 21st Century, questions the way in which we discuss or avoid the problems and politics of sex. Examining the complexities and interconnections between sex, consent, gender, class, race, and power, this stunning narrative unravels the nuances of discrimination and preference, pornography and freedom, rape and racial injustice, to name a few. This will be held in conversation with B. Rolat, where Srinivasan will discuss the urgent political debates and what it means to be free. I'm delighted to introduce our first guest. Amiya Srinivasan is the Chichli Professor of Social and Political Theory at All Souls College, Oxford. She is the author of The Right to Sex, a Sunday Times bestseller. Next, we have B. Rolat, a writer and journalist whose award-winning travelogue, In Search of Mary, was named a biography of the year. She is now writing a novel about a girl who can't stop stealing. The Women Translators session has been canceled, so enjoy this session. This is a lovely session. Over to you. You will definitely enjoy this session. She's here, everybody. A massive applause, please. <laughs> So many of you came on Friday and we're very disappointed. Amir was unfortunately ill, but she has risen from the dead like a feminist Jesus Christ. <laughs> and she is among us and I'm very delighted about that. On the that. third day. <laughs> <laughs> On the third day, here she is. So we're all here as your disciples. Um, I'm really excited about this book, The Right to Sex. Um, in my day job back in London town, I work for the British Library. And a few years ago, we had a, a huge exhibition called Unfinished Business, The Fight for Women's Rights. And it charted the history of feminism in the UK and the word on everybody's lips in the programming was, was your work and the work that you're doing in this collection of essays in particular because it takes those themes and wraps them around the world. So I would like to start by asking you about the collection and how it came about and also what you mean by this term, the right to sex. Um, thanks so much B, for being here. Thanks to all of you for um, coming again to see me. Um, so maybe I'll start with the question of what I mean by the right to sex. So it's an ambiguous notion, of course, because on one hand, um, we do have a certain kind of right to sex, right? So um, whether or not it's recognized, we all have the right to have consensual sex with, with partners um, who, who cons consensually want to have sex with us as well. Um, but the, the notion of the right to sex that I'm trying to talk about in one of the central essays of the book is the notion of having an entitlement to sex um, as if it's a basic right, like the right to food or water, um, that you find, um, I think, deep at the heart of patriarchy and very much expressed in something like in the incel subculture. Um, Just explain the incels for right. people that might not know. <laughs> explain the incels, but then let's get back to why I wrote yeah, the book. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, so the incel, as some people call it a movement, I think that's, that's too, it's a word of too much flattery, but it's a kind of internet subculture, um, but that unfortunately erupts into the real world. So it's populated by generally young men who feel very aggrieved and because their supposed entitlement to sex with a certain kind of woman, normally young, white, pretty, they often say chaste and virginal women, um, isn't being satisfied and recognized. And they feel politically aggrieved. They see themselves as a political class suffering from deprivation um, and spend a lot of time on chat rooms talking about this. And sometimes this erupts into extraordinary acts of violence, the most famous one of which has been uh, the 2014 
Elliot Roger attacks in California. And that incident actually opens up the title essay of the book. And so kind of getting, using insetal ideology as a way of thinking more broadly about patriarchy and race and class is one of the themes of, of the book. But in general, the book comes for me out of teaching. Um, so I was never taught feminism as an undergraduate or a graduate student. I was mostly taught by men. Um, and I think most of the men who taught me didn't think that feminism was that intellectually interesting, even if they sort of politically agreed with it. Um, and so, so I came- How did you achieve feminism? How did you get there? Uh, well, it's a constant struggle. Um, but I came to it as a graduate student on my own. Actually, one of my friends gave me a copy of Simone de Beauvoir's The Second Sex. And I remember reading it and feeling astonished by its complexity, its depth, its seriousness, its philosophical seriousness. It was to me like reading Plato's Republic or Hume's Enquiries. It was dazzling and imaginative and utopian and not at all um, just dark and gloomy and man-hating, right? Which was the stereotype I brought to feminist theory. And so I started teaching feminist theory when I became myself a, a professor of philosophy to my students with the hope that they would feel the same thing about reading these historical feminist texts. Um, and what I found was that was absolutely true. And in lots of cases, these texts from the 70s, the 80s, were resonating with them in a very, very contemporary way. And so each of the essays is an attempt to take on a different dimension of sex as a political phenomenon um, in a way that I think isn't currently being spoken about, but that relates to kind of critical interventions that were often made by historical feminists, or I say historical, many of them are still alive, but really important uh, feminists from the history of that political struggle. Okay, you are sort of intentionally un uncomfortable in your writing. You take us to places of, of conflict and of ambivalence. Um, you actually say, these essays do not offer a home. Um, and you refer to ideas of, of coalition politics. Um, there's, a, there's a section on that in the opening essay. And when you consider the political landscape of the UK right now and the state of discourse around feminism, which has got trapped into an alleged uh, discussion of, of trans rights, which has in, in effect become a, a wedge topic to divide people that should be allies, it makes me wonder, considering that alternative, why not be um, emphatically more uh, coalescent and try to, to, to bridge that divide. Why explore those uncomfortable places? Mm. So I have really arrived at the view that <clears throat> fear of complexity and truth is disastrous for any libertary political movement. Any political movement that really dreams of freedom and emancipation has to be unafraid, I think, of the thorniness and thicketiness of politics. So the book itself opens by taking on the specter of the false rape accusation, right? Which is something that um, lots of men increasingly talk about. I mean, that's true in India, it's true in the UK, it's true in the US, as Me Too especially took, took hold. Um, men started obsessing over the idea that they might be falsely accused of rape. And one kind of feminist response to this is just to say, is just to point out correctly that many more magnitudes of women are raped, and indeed many more magnitudes of men are raped than men are falsely accused of rape. And I think that's very important to say, but I also think it's important to say that false accusation happens and it's a moral and political disaster when it happens, but we need to understand systematically to whom it happens, because there are certain classes of men historically and now, especially under conditions of white supremacy, colonialism, who are particularly susceptible to false accusation. I mean, the, the false rape accusation has been a weapon of colonial 
Um, E.M. Forster. Exactly. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, but but I, want to, I want to step back from this particular sorry. theme, which, which is an important one, we'll come to it. But the, in terms of, you know, the, the divided landscape, the divided politics, um, in fact, it was Rennie Edo Lodge at this very festival a couple of years ago who said, and, I, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, when the fascists come, we'll all be against the wall. And she was talking about LGBTQ plus rights, um, environmentalists, feminists. And so there's a sense of... Um, there's a, worse, there's a worse alternative out there. Do we have the luxury to be in fighting like this? And there's almost a sense that, that right-wing poli politics doesn't have so much dissent and so much mind for ambivalence and the kind of internal conflict that you're describing, and in, and, and, which is fascinating in the abstract, but in the real world, is it something that we should be overcoming? Right, I see. Yeah, I do think it's interesting that in general, right-wing movements are characterized by enormous discipline, party discipline. And that is not something that the left is usually very good at. There are moments and then it swiftly disintegrates. Um, and that's, of course, because the left has a more hostile relationship to hierarchy. Discipline goes hand in hand with hierarchy. It's very easy to enforce discipline when there's a strict hierarchy. The moment you're trying to be yourself an egalitarian movement, listen to everyone, include all voices, it's very difficult to squash dissent. And I think that egalitarianism is very important to any genuinely left movement. But I think of ambivalence actually as a way through some of these, you know, um, internal disagreements. Um, so, I mean, just to take uh, the trans uh, rights issue, I think it's important to actually sometimes hear what, not quite what um, the critics and the opponents of trans rights are saying, but what they're actually trying to express. Because I think what they're often expressing, they're not saying, is that they are deeply anxious about their own sense of identity and gender and sexuality. It's a profound threat to their, self, their sense of themselves as just straightforwardly women or straightforwardly men. And the feminist, uh, the British feminist Jacqueline Rose has this wonderful way of putting it. She says, all of us are literally haunted in our dreams by other genders, other sexual possibilities for ourselves. We're haunted by the female or male or hermaphrodite versions of ourselves. And that has to be repressed so that we can go through the social and political world that insists on all of us being cleanly women and cleanly men. So I think that sort of ambivalence and complexity, when you really embrace it, can, in a kind of therapeutic way, be a way through some of this disagreement. Thank you. Um, I would like to come back now to the Me Too movement, because it was such a key moment in, in the history of feminism. Um, and I would like to sort of locate our thinking around the time, it was 2017, and there was an Indian student called Raya Sarkar who cir circulated something called The List, you'll remember, which I think was, and it was, it was, my response was the same. At first I was very concerned about the lack of due process, and it's just what you were talking about, um, and how, how that then tips over into observing that due process was just too slow. It was inadequate to what was needed. Um, can you set that in, in, the, in the trajectory of Me Too? And can I also ask you to read that paragraph? <laughs> can we find it? There's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a sort of encapsulating paragraph that I'd really like Amir to shall, read out. Yes. Shall I begin with paragraph B? OK, so this is the, um, it was 31, isn't it? So this is the closing paragraph of um, the first Buckle essay up. of the book called The Conspiracy Against Men. I should just apologize in advance to my father who's in the audience because there is a swear word um, <laughs> in this and he doesn't like it when I swear. Okay. These disgraced but loved, ruined but rich, never to be employed again until they are employed again, prodigal sons of me too. They and their defenders are not for all their protestations of innocence and accusations of lynching, outraged by the falsity of women's accusations. They are outraged by the truth of those accusations. They are outraged most of all that saying sorry doesn't make it all better, that women expect them together with the world that brought them to power to change. But why should they? Don't you know who the fuck they are?
so I think your question about the list or, uh, you know, the U.S. version of this was the shitty men in media list. Um, these are all cases of women using non-formal means to uh, spread the word about abusive, harassing men. Um, and I, 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 th it's, it's, I think this is a profoundly difficult question for feminism. Um, so on one hand, what do you do when the processes available to you are just not are not efficient, they're not fair, they're overseen by people who are systematically biased, right? When, I mean, why to, what does it mean to turn to the police if you know that the police abuse their wives at higher rates, are systematically guilty of sexual violence and there harassment? Are, sorry for interrupting, but there are currently 800 police officers in the Met Police in London under investigation for sexual crimes, 800 currently working officers. So. Yeah, and it's just not, and you know, this is a very robust statistic across the world, and it's not that surprising. I mean, think about the kind of men who are attracted to going into um, th this sort of role, right? I mean, there's lots of kind of de demographic issues going on here, but there's also just what does it mean to want to be the kind of person who is seen as invested with the power to discipline and punish? And what happens to you when you are so empowered? We, we know that putting people in certain kinds of roles um, uh, profoundly changes them. So what do you do when you don't have access to fair procedures? Well, it's extremely tempting and it seems very reasonable and just to use other measures available to you. And social media gives this a whole new range of possibility, right? Because you don't just write a list, you can then disseminate it on social media, on Twitter and so on. So I think it's a completely understandable and indeed reasonable response to very real failures of systemic justice. At the same time, I think certain women want to act as if these kinds of social media or um, non-formal um, responses to abuse and violence don't have any material and real consequences right, and therefore just get a kind of free pass. And that's just wrong, right? I mean, these lists and, and have extraordinary power, they can, right? So a single voice on Twitter is not really going to do anything, right? But many voices altogether can actually get people fired. And do we want to embolden employers who are typically already all too emboldened in their ability to hire and fire? to fire people on the basis of um, accusations that may or may not be true, even if they are true. And so I think this is one of those complex, thickety things that feminists really need to reckon with. What sort of procedures would be genuinely feminist? Because what I worry about is that same punitive impulse that lies behind the carceral system, behind the police force, um, behind you know, the worst forms of, of criminal justice or so-called criminal justice, then just animating feminist responses. And it's very satisfying. I mean, the moment, it can feel very unfair to say to women, look, you finally got some power after centuries of disempowerment, but you have to behave better than men. You can't do what they did with that power. But I think that's true. But part of justice is seeing justice to be done. And so it is very counterintuitive to, you know, the, 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 the argument of carceral feminism. It is, it, you know, it can feel counterintuitive because rapists should be brought to justice. I mean, here, you know, there's conversations around the death penalty. Um, so you can see how that's, that's, that's quite a, a chewy one to digest. Absolutely. I mean, you know, when was it three or four of Jyoti Singh's um, rapists, gang rapists were put to death. I mean, of course, there was a part of me, not one I want to avow, that felt, I don't want to say happy, because, but, you know, felt like some kind of, um, some sort of relief, right? At the same time, I was really struck by this interview with one of the, one of the wives from Bihar of um, one of the men who had been put to death. And she said, you know, what is this, why does no one care about me? Who is supposed to feed my children now that he is dead? 
how am I going to take care of them? Am I not also a woman? So it's very interesting to think about which women the state cares about, right? So we all know that, of course, certain women's rapists are brought to justice and certain women's rapists aren't brought to justice. But we also know that these very strong punitive responses by the state can act as a cover for the deep inequalities that actually make certain women very susceptible to violence. I mean, domestic violence, right, a scourge in most parts of the world, is directly correlated with male unemployment. If you wanted to deal seriously with domestic violence, you would make sure men were employed, and you would also make sure that women and children were not economically dependent on men. And sometimes in some countries, for example in Brazil, when you increase the penalties for domestic violence, the rates of women's reporting goes down because they know that these men are now going to be thrown in prison and they are going to be more economically precarious. So actually they're less likely to report to the police that um, they are, they have been the victims of domestic violence. What they need is safety and they need money. And those aren't satisfying to those of us watching this happen, but I promise you it's more satisfying to the women who are actually in these situations. I love the presence of your students in your writing. I know that one of your students is actually here today, shout out to Beth. Um, and I just, you know, it seems like an interactive experience. They're getting something from you, you're getting something from them. In particular, the chapters on, on pornography um, and on one that's brilliantly entitled On Not Sleeping With Your Students, which is very interesting. Um, can you talk about what it's like to be in your, what is, what is it like to be taught by you? Oh, goodness. <laughs> um, I, I hope they enjoy it. Sometimes their faces suggest that they don't. No. Um, I... I mean, I think as, as, as you've mentioned from the book, I mean, I do learn a huge amount from my students. And I think the spirit in which I teach them feminism in particular is one which I first ask them to just take these texts seriously and try to understand what they're saying, but also what they're doing. Um, and not bring too many of their kind of contemporary views that are often shaped by social media, um, which is kind of conventional understandings to bear on these texts and just kind of read them in their own right. And maybe set, actually set aside the question for a while of what this means for them and how much it speaks to their experience. Um, but then we always get to those questions. It's inevitable with feminism, right? I mean, what draws people, feminism's power, I think, rests in, in its ability to politicize what feels like an enormously personal set of experiences. Um, if you take the example of pornography, say, you were quite surprised by the responses yes. which kind of drew you in a particular direction. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so that, this is something on which my students have profoundly shaped my views. Um, so if you teach a kind of intro to feminist theory class, as you'll know, it's basically mandatory that you spend a week teaching about pornography because the debates about pornography were so important in the history of feminism, um, especially in the, in the 70s. And in a way, debates about pornography tore the women's liberation movement, at least in the US and to a certain extent the UK, apart. Um, I didn't think my students were going to find this very interesting, right? It seems quite quaint, the idea of feminists arguing about whether their sh pornography should exist or be available, especially when pornography then meant going to CD movie theaters or like buying a top shelf magazine. I have to say, there's a, there's, I read a line which was, uh, and the acronym WAP, Women Against Pornography, and of course to the modern audience, WAP means something else, right. thanks to Cardi B and Megan Thee Stallion, so that's been quite a feminist trajectory of its own, but sorry for interrupting. No, and, and so it, I thought it was going to be feel to them extremely outdated um, in this era of totally ubiquitous online pornography to which they had all been, you know, exposed since they, since I don't know, nine, ten, whenever they were online. And I was really struck um, by how responsive they were to these anti-porn polemics from the 70s. And I, I don't just mean my women's students, my 
male students also were really struck by a certain part of the argument that you find in people like Andrea Dworkin and Catherine McKinnon. I should say arguments I, I don't wholly buy myself, but that really resonated with my students. They were struck by the idea that pornography teaches, that pornography has a kind of pedagogic function, that it teaches you what's erotic, what's sexually exciting, and specifically it teaches you that a certain kind of dynamic of male domination and female submission is the erotically sexually charged thing. And so it teaches them how to have sex. Um, and my, most of my students just agreed with this in a way that I found incredibly uh, disturbing. Um, and so that's, the, that's one of the issues I try and grapple with. I mean, that's the central problem I have in that pornography essay because we can't, I mean, it's implausible, it's totally implausible, I think, and undesirable to try and use legislation to deal with internet pornography. I mean, you know, here, for example, in India, um, the government has tried to routinely shut down access to Pornhub, but of course a mirror site springs up within, within days because um, it's in the interests of this huge corporation called MindGeek that owns the four biggest porn sites in the world to have the huge consumptive audience of India, right? But I, one, one thing I try and bring out in the book is that I'm not necessarily talking about pornography per se, right? I'm not talking about just the graphic depiction in film or photos of sexual activity. We're talking about mainstream pornography that is, had, well, it's algorithmically selected for you by a company whose sole interest is making money, right? And, who's, and who gets and who makes that money typically by stealing content from actual pornographic producers who as a result don't, can't really afford to pay the women and men who work in pornography who tend to be quite low income people um, and feed it to you and in feeding it to you, ensure that your sexual preferences and tastes become more and more similar to everyone else's. So the fundamental problem in a way with pornography, mainstream pornography, is that it's so boring, right? It's so unimaginative. It's killed off the sexual imagination. You did not expect to hear that at Jaipur. <laughs> I want to go to another horrible part of the internet. Um, it's a, a person who was brought to my attention by one of my teenage daughters a couple of years ago, a person by the name of Andrew Tate. And I had a quick look, yeah. I had a quick look and I went, oh, that looks a bit gross. I'm not, I don't even want to think about that. And I was obviously wrong. And this is just shows you why old feminists should always listen to young feminists. Um, because now look what's happened. Um, he is, of course, a um, uh, in, uh, in custody in Romania on charges of trafficking and rape. And interesting testimony has just been coming out overnight, actually, about uh, the way that he trains uh, boys online to assault women verbally on social media. And so a number of, of young women have, have testified about this. But he's hugely influential. I mean, that's disgusting enough, but he's hugely influential Millions of boys adore him, quote him, and this is why it was so upsetting for, for my daughter. You know, that's, that's the chat that they use, that's their bants, and, and they think he's wonderful. Can you explain the existence of Andrew Tate, please? <laughs> How have we got here? <laughs> Sorry to call you. <laughs> I've got 22 minutes left, yeah. so I'll see what I can do. So I think it would have to be a multi-pronged explanation because some of the themes of someone like Andrew Tate or someone who's a kind of slightly more benign or maybe slightly more respectable version, Jordan Peterson. Um, sorry, was that controversial? I mean, <laughs> um, regurgitate actually incredibly traditional themes, right? So really, there's an intense nostalgia at the heart of these seemingly incredibly cutting edge and contemporary um, trends, right? There's a nostalgia for a, a pre-sexual liberation past with what 
um, Peterson calls enforced monogamy, right? Which is only ever really enforced for women, right? So a norm of no premarital sex for women, a certain kind of social sorting, assuring that every man would have access to a woman, a very traditional family, right? Where the role of a woman was to stay at home and nurture children, but also, of course, um, nurture the husband and his bruised ego when he came home from work, because of course this kind of family is central to the capitalist order, right? Because you can't exploit a worker in the factory or in the fields unless you know he's going to go home and be taken care of along with his own children by his wife. Um, and so this can seem like a very kind of uh, contemporary thing, but I think there's, there's this profound nostalgia, but that we see, of course, that nostalgia um, echoing across, across the world when we think about the rise of forms of ethno-nationalism in general, right? Nostalgia for a certain kind of heroic national past when families were simple, when there were no trans people, there were no queer people, there weren't women out at work, there wasn't immigration. And of course, this is always like a falsified, a falsified past. Um, and, and, of, and then you couple that with social media and together with rising inequality and the very real despair that young people justly feel about the prospects of the world with an ongoing climate crisis and a total global indifference to it among people, among older generations, spiraling economic inequality um, and, you know, I mean, the inability of young people to access basic things like the housing market, you know, middle class people. Um, and I think that is a recipe for disaster. And that's part of what you've got here. So I think it's, it's all of those things kind of coming, coming together. Please don't ask me what the solution is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure someone will. I want to um, relocate us back into India um, with, uh, there's a brilliant book I read earlier this year by Sriana Bhattacharya called Desperately Seeking Shah Rukh Khan. I don't know if you've read it. Wonderful study of um, both poor, rich, rural, urban Indian women, all of whom um, joined in love of Shah Rukh Khan, as we all are. Um, and she, she's an economist, and she look, uses this prism to look at the lack of women's economic participation, which India rate, ranks in the lowest five in the world, which is kind of quite astonishing. And for me, this is the, the great feminist conundrum of India. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, it is such a um, complicated and puzzling uh, issue. I mean, you wouldn't think that, right, from spending time in India with Indian women. Yeah, um, they're, not, they're always, the, you know, everywhere you look, women are working, women are doing things, exactly. but informally. Informally, but you, so you have a massive informal sector, um, a much smaller formal sector. And I mean, the history of India's economic development has been one that I think has been largely dictated as it has been in so many decolonizing countries by prerogatives that aren't Indian, right? By Western prerogatives, which of course consistently and systematically serve the interests of certain Indians. Um, but you know, Devaki Jain in the 70s was lamenting, um, or sorry, in the 80s was already lamenting uh, the particular form Indian economic development was taking under the um, under American hegemony, right, uh, which gets established through the third world debt crisis and allows for development on on very specific terms. Um, so, what what does one need? Well, what would it be to really center, I think, women's economic material interests? Um, you'd have to begin by thinking about the role that Indian women really do play, and poor Indian women in particular, in like holding this country together, right? In, in all the social reproductive work they do, all of the, the necessary informal economy work they do, and asking like, what does it look, to, look like to support that? And one very standard answer that, again, has been imported from a very American vision has been microfinance. And we've heard lots and lots of stories about the wonders of microfinance. It's um, 
there's also a very dark side to this. I mean, there should be a dark side to any lending program where the interest rates are something like 30%. Mm. And there's a dark side to when women are then uh, susceptible to coercion, right? Because then they have to go borrow and borrow more and more because what you haven't done is secured the conditions for their liberation and freedom first, right? But you go and ask poor Indian women what they need and they will tell you they want infrastructure, right? They want lighting, they want access to clean water, they want education, they want health care. It's not super mysterious what needs to be done. The question is always a political question. This leads to my last question, and I'm really annoyed that we're running out of time because I've got so many more, but I know we're going to have lots from the floor, so I will come to the audience after this. But that you've just put me in mind of one of the questions that's in your book, feminism, what, what do we do when we win? And what does it look like to, to win? Yes, so I think it's very, it's my, the reason I asked that question in the book is because I think there's a kind of safety being in the position of the victim, yeah. right? Being always in the position of the people who have not won. But there are lots of women who have not won, right? Actually, most women in the world have not won. But there is a class of women who are extraordinarily powerful, and I am among them and you are among them. And I think it's extremely important for those women of all nationalities, but usually of a single class, um, to own up to the extraordinary power they do have um, in shaping um, political objectives, in shaping the aims of international NGOs, and taking up that posture of the victim all of the time, uh, I don't think owns up to the power um, that lots of women women do have. So it's never a question of just, um, you know, when do we win eventually? It's really important to see the power that we do have. And I don't mean in a kind of hopeful way, like see the power we do have so we can do better. It's like, see the power we can, we do have so we can see the violence that we're perpetrating, right? I think it's very important to understand, especially as economically and class privileged women, what what sort of infrastructure, political, legal, cultural infrastructure we uphold under the umbrella of feminism that is actually making many women, the poorest women in the world, worst off. Well, start by reading this book, which is a feminist win. I'm going to ask for questions now, but I should warn you that they better be quick. And none of this, I'm going to give a sermon or can I ask three questions? Okay, so make them sharp. Very eager person with the hand up there. Please, can you get your microphones in swiftly and a, and a microphone to the person in the middle uh, waving hands with the glasses on. So please, microphone runners, if you want to get in there and get the microphones to them, there's one there and one there. Um, yes, on you go. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, I'm a high school English teacher, and we just started reading the books Orcs and, Orcs and Crake, which also connects with this idea of pornography. And you're talking about how kids as young as nine are being introduced to it, and it's something that can be so anonymous. And so if the first time they're having discussions about this is when they're in your freshman feminist seminar class, by about 10 years, the damage is already done and it's too late. How can we bring about discussions about pornography with younger students that can be really uncomfortable and, and can cause, I think, a lot of shame, but in a way that is a, a way that doesn't cause shame and is a way that we can have these open conversations with students who are, who are quite young. Thank you, that's a really good question. I'm gonna, I'm gonna collect two, that's a, that's a great one. How to talk about pornography to young people. And there was one here, can you go please? Uh, yeah, so I don't know if it's a word. Uh, Microphone up. Oh. Yeah, so marital rape is not recognized as a crime in India, as a result of which uh, the conversation around sex, what we are taught, even though I'm a very educated, privileged person, is that sex is something that is done to us, not something that we enjoy, and therefore it takes away the autonomy of it. I have access to young teenagers and girls who have questions about sex. So even when the law isn't protecting us, the culture isn't protecting us, how do we approach this conversation where I tell either my domestic workers or the women around me that, you know, you have the right to enjoy it as well and you have the right to say no. Thank you. Do you want to respond to those two? Keep your hand up, please, if you want to have a question. Wonderful questions, thank you. I think the answer to both of them, uh, both questions, uh, one about pornography and about um, engendering young women's sense of sexual autonomy um, and sovereignty is, 
is the, the very old answer of sex education. Um, but sex education can't just be biological education. It's not an education in just biology and parts of the body and the reproductive cycle. And it has to start from an incredibly young age. It's got to include things like porn literacy, ethics, sexual communication. And the thing I would say to all of those many people across the world who balk at the idea of teaching young children about sex is that they are already being taught about sex, but not by you. Um, yeah. And I think once you have that realization, you realize that there's no protecting childhood innocence, right? Um, then, then you can actually begin to have a conversation about what a really robust uh, curriculum that starts K to you know in kindergarten, and I don't mean like teaching kindergartners the, the about s sex per se, but I do mean talking to them about their bodies and what it means to allow people to touch their body or for them to say no to people touching their body. That's something that you know a four-year-old, a five-year-old should absolutely be taught, and that's how you build the groundwork for a, a further set of conversations. Um, and porn literacy, I think, has to be part of that education too from a pretty young age. Although that is a particular problem, of course, because it's a problem from a pedagogical perspective. How do you teach a text that you can't show your students? And in fact, you don't really want to show your students. So I think even the greatest literature professor would struggle with, with that question. <laughs> um, we'll move on to the next one. There's a, a person at the back. You've had your hand up. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you so much. Brilliant session. Um, so my question for you is, and taking a cue from, I'm right here. Uh, taking a cue from uh, the last part of your conversation, one of the most befuddling statistics uh, with respect to women's participation in the labor force is a reduction in urban educated women participating in the labor force uh, in the Indian context. And uh, one of the reasons for this has been uh, because my husband's doing well, so, you know, I, I have the opportunity to piece out uh, and, and opt out the workforce. How do you make sense of that? How do you make sense of this push and pull conundrum of, you know, men doing well and that almost becoming a way for women to evidently step out the workforce as is happening in India? Thank you for that. We're going to take another question from here on the end, please. Yes. Hi, uh, thank no, you. No, sorry, I meant the, oh, okay. Three questions, because I want to get to you too, very quickly. All right, yeah. So I'm also a high school teacher, and one of the things that I struggle a lot with is uh, incorporating the concept of feminism with my male students. So I have a group of male students who are worshippers of Andrew Tate. And, you know, I, most of them don't know why they like him. It's because they have to like him and they think that he's popular and he's going to do something for us. So I had this conversation where I wanted to know why they liked him and they had no answer. So, you know, just uh, how as a teacher I can at this very young age, so ninth graders, you know, um, help them understand just a little bit of concept of feminism. Thank you. Hi, uh, I was just wondering, could you reflect a little bit on what it's like to be a feminist in white colonial academia and um, how that also relates to, for instance, South Asian academia, which is so deeply caste-based and uh, where Dalit, Adivasi and Muslim feminists have to fight so hard to even be in it, let alone be heard. And people at the back and sides, please do keep your hands up if you have a question. I don't want to miss out anybody uh, who's at, at the back of the room. Do you want to? Yes. Ah, such good questions. Um, okay, so this issue of um, educated urban women uh, leaving the job force because um, their husbands are making what is what was historically in the 50s called a, a family wage. Um, and... And it's interesting because lots of, in the US and the UK, lots of leftists dream of the return to the family wage, right? Uh, wages that are high enough that you can support an entire family, that you can support your wife and children on. Um, these aren't feminist leftists, these are just male leftists. Um, and you don't typically think about what might be missing from that picture. So on one hand, I think that we should be trying to move steadily towards a society in which people work as little as possible, right? I don't believe in the value of work per se. Um, and so if people genuinely want to not work um, and, and don't need to in, in this kind of case, you know, 
I, I don't think that's in itself an objection, but of course there's a gendered thing going on here, right? Because they aren't just kicking back, there's often an expectation, an ideological expectation expressed on the part of the male worker that he would prefer to be able to make a family wage and have his wife at home. Um, and of course, why does she concede to this? Because women's work, women's right to be in the workforce is always understood as contingent and precarious and somehow less absolute than a man's right to be in the workforce. Um, so I think there are, so I don't think the answer to this is wage oppression, um, but the answer has got to be about more cultural dynamics, right? So, but also how do you make people more able to live in non-nuclear families, right? What would it look like to create various kinds of social policies that don't require people to enter conventional marriage in order to be kind of economically uh, self-sustained? That's just a partial answer to an I hate question. to bustle you on, but I think partial answers is all we're going to do Wait, no, in no, order no, to no, get can to I, the, No, no, yeah. can I, I have to talk about these male students and... Yes, you, yeah, okay, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> okay. So here's what I, what I do with very young uh, men I meet. I never Hector, um, because no one wants to be Hectored, um, but especially young people. But I find, but asking them about how their experiences of enforced heteromasculinity. When are the, when in their lives have they felt they've had to perform a certain kind of manliness that actually they find painful? And there is no man who has never felt that. There is certainly no boy who has never felt that. And what feminism does is, in it, I think in its best form, is speaks to that form of entrapment too. Because there's no one that patriarchy doesn't harm. And, and I think that, you know, and that's the beginning of a conversation about what feminism can do for men. I don't think it simply has to be about empathy for your sisters and your mothers and your female friends. I think it can also be a very personal inquiry into the ways in which norms of masculinity actually repress and um, repress men, including the men who feel the enormous pressure to provide for their wives and children. Like, it's a very traditional part of a Marxist feminist, feminist analysis to see those men as also disciplined by the combination of patriarchy and capitalism. So that's how I would begin that conversation. And then finally, ah, being a feminist and white colonialist, and I should say very classist, uh, casteist academia because you don't find really any non-Brahmins in Oxford. Um, so, it's been pretty good <laughs> in the sense that I've been extraordinarily lucky. Um, but I'm very aware of my caste and class privilege as I move through institutions like Yale and Oxford where I've spent most of my academic life. I have an extremely um, brilliant uh, supervisee who's working on the history, a uh, DPhil supervisee who's working on the history of Dalit Bahujan feminist activism and it's her experience is very different and I've learned a lot from that. Um, and there's a huge amount of work to be done. And one, I suppose my most, in this, in, insofar as it's difficult for me, the difficulty has been wanting to do so much more than is possible because there's so much more desire and demand and need from like students than is possible for someone like me alone to meet. So I need more, more people. Our last question is here. Yeah, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, the, sorry? Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I actually wanted to ask you mention the uh, wedge between trans rights and feminism. So I feel like in my opinion, they're competing for victimhood. Trans people think they're oppressed and women think they're oppressed. And it seems to become a battle of who is more oppressed. As, at least that's what I've seen on Twitter threads. So what can be done to bridge this gap? Because I don't think queer rights, especially trans rights and feminism should be a battle at all. So what can be done to bridge this? Yeah, so this phenomenon is sometimes called the Oppression Olympics, and I don't think it's a very um, fruitful enterprise. So I think, I mean, so there's this wonderful black American feminist named Bernice Johnson Reagan, and she's the person who I use as my main theorist of coalitional politics. And she says that 
the, 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 your decision about who to go in coalition with is really by, driven by the question of survival. So don't think about whether you agree with other people. Think about who is your common enemy, right? And I think what a lot of feminist um, critics of trans rights forget is that they're these people on the right who seemingly agree with them over trans issues also want them back in the home they want them out of the workforce. They want to curtail their reproductive freedoms. They, you know, they, they are only um, agreeing with them precisely because they can think, use them as a weapon in a very particular battle. But, but the women, the, the anti-trans women are next in line. And so I think it's really important to keep in mind the deeper structures that um, oppress ranges and groups of people. Um, and that's the way to overcome, not overcome disagreement, but create coalition across disagreement. A massive round of applause, Amiya Srinivasi and her book, The Right to Sex, which I hope you've all already bought. Amir will be signing outside, so form a massive queue outside to get your book signed. And thank you very much for coming. And feminism is gorgeous and feminism is for everyone. <laughs>